I'm now going to announce, uh, introduce our uh, opening plenary. We decided to do something a little different this year. We're going to have Bjarne Struestrup do our opening plenary. So, uh, Bjarne, I have something for you. You're, you're going to need that. You're going to need that. And the reason you're going to need that is because people are going to be going to the, uh, to the conference store and they're going to be buying things that you oh, need to autograph. God. <laughs> so uh, this, one is, this one is for you and I'll put it here and it can watch you. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. You've you never know what's going to happen around here. Um, so, I'm, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about C++ as I usually am. And this year, it, it sort of comes from a pair of questions that I get in some form or other um, every two weeks or thereabouts. One is, along the lines, uh, why did you invent C++ and what it was meant to do? And the other one, what is C++ today and does it have anything to do with what it used to be? And there are people who, who want um, the different combinations of answers of those things, like it, it really shouldn't have changed or it was really good at change completely. And I'm, I'm going to tell the, the story as, uh, as I see it, which is a little bit more complicated, of course, uh, you don't actually survive for 40 years without change or without stability. So I'm going to talk a little bit about where we started. Um, and then I'm going to talk about a book I wrote in 94, trying to articulate the principles of C++. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what I can dream about, about C++ 20. In other words, wh what, what will that deliver for us? And so how we grow a language, how we maintain a coherence a direction, and how to stay true, and also how to change as we go along. Um, C++ was born at Bell Labs in uh, 79. That was a great place. Um, that's Murray Hill there. Um, the, the, um, you can see the, the arrow down to the... Uh, that's the left of the slide, uh, shows where all the software stuff comes from, and uh, the other end of the building is where we got the hardware. Um, and there was great people, great technical environment. You could always find an expert on anything you were interested in. You could walk into their office, and they were usually patient, even for young researchers like me. And uh, still in contact with a lot of them. And. Um, one of the things I learned was that they had this idea that innovation was the combination of invention and development. That is, it's not enough to have an idea. You actually have to work on making that into something real and useful. On the other hand, it's not enough just to work your butt off and uh, do a lot of work, because if you don't have any good ideas, it's just wasted. And so. That kind of combination um, was, was important for my thinking. And then finally, there were so many problems in, in that building. It was a, they were running the communication system for, for North America and beyond, and anything that had anything to do with communication, including computing, including transmission, including uh, radio astronomy, uh, was in that building. So there was lots of challenges um, to, to make it's it interesting. And so the earliest idea, uh, I decided that I was going to build a distributed system. There was not many of those at the time. If I'd succeeded, we would probably have got the first Unix cluster out of it. Um, but basically, I decided I needed to use hardware efficiently, and I need to manage complexity. Uh, you need that for a distributed system. And there was no language that could do both the hardware and the abstraction bits. And so I uh, thought that I could just take a simulator's class system, put it into uh, C, and I could get both. And um, 
So there's the overarching uh, aims. And you have to realize that the time was different. Um, that's uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie working on a machine that when we got networking, it was called research. And that actually was the machine where C++ was started on. Uh, you could get 256 kilobytes of memory for your uh, programs, and that was sufficient at the time. Um, so it was a different world, but if you, if you look at the overarching aims there, they're not that different from what we, um, what we hit today. And um, in, the, in the earliest aims, again, the first month or so, I decided I had to stick close to C. I did not want to teach people how to write a for loop. I mean, everybody who can write systems programming, can write serious programming, know how to write a loop, and we, we had them some nice ones in C. And uh, my, my statement was that my mistakes, I don't make mistakes if I designed a new language. And it's unlikely that my mistakes are less bad than Dennis's. And we know Dennis's, so let's, let's stick to it. That's the beginning of, of compatibility. It gave tool uh, compatibility, it gave performance. On the other hand, the type checking in classical C was atrocious, and I couldn't live without it, so I took the ideas which came from Simula and just about any other language and said, going, we want strong static type checking, that's the ideal, but it's really hard to achieve when you always ha also have to do uh, cool and unusual things to hardware. And uh, also I found over the years that compatibility is even harder than I thought. Some of the problems linger uh, to this day. Um, and evolution was essential. It was perfectly obvious, even to me, that I couldn't build a perfect language. And so you shouldn't try. You should try and build something that can grow into something that's much better. I started thinking about things as a tool, and then I realized I was designing a language. And um, then uh, I realized I couldn't even define perfect. And so you have to set up feedback loops. You have to know roughly what you're doing. Then you have to see whether it works and fix it. And so C++ was designed from the very early days to evolve, to change. But also, I had my ideals. I was very keen on abstraction. I didn't want to have specific solutions to specific problems. I wanted to provide tools so that people could solve problems I couldn't imagine. And I wanted general reality because I didn't really know how much I needed to do, and therefore I couldn't limit my domain to just the right domain because I wouldn't know what it was. And then, I mean, those computers there, uh, they weren't very fast and they didn't have much memory, so performance, efficiency, compactness was absolutely essential. And so here's an example of some, something done in the previous millennium. Um, C looked like, you can see there to the left, if you declare a square root function and then call square root of two, if you're lucky, you crashes. You crash. Because it forgets to turn the integer into a double, because I didn't tell it the, the argument was a double, and so you get an um, unnormalized floating point number, and if you're lucky, you crash. If you're not lucky, you get the wrong result. So that I started uh, fixing, so we could declare function arguments. Then there was default that the type for anything you, you said was an int, so you didn't have to declare it. I couldn't live with that either, so I uh, fixed the, um, the, 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 the definition syntax while I was at it. And then I banned call of undeclared functions because, well, again, we have this nasty problem that it either crashes or it doesn't and you should hope for a crash. Um, if you're really lucky and you make no mistakes whatsoever, everything will work. But I, I don't like that bit. So static checking was the ideal. This was the first step towards it. Actually, that was somewhat controversial. And for at least 10 years, C++ was criticized seriously for not being compatible with C because it didn't allow the code on the left there. Um, people really like their bugs. And you had comments like, 
You, you, you mean I have to look at a declaration to know how I, uh, what, what the call means? I mean, can't I just write my code and get it right? No, you can't. Experience shows that there are people who can get that right, and there's not very many of them, and I'm not one of them, so I don't want to live in that world. Okay, and it was definitely incompatible, created a lot of problems. The argument that I could co convert with very little tools, about 10,000 lines of C to C++ a day at the time, didn't seem to impress people. Um, this compat incompatibility became a reason for not liking C++, um, independent of why. But it's essential for type checking, overloading, uh, good use of defined types, consistent linking. If you don't have that, you, you, aren't, uh, you can't start. And some of the problems in, insisted today, um, if you assign a floating point number to a character, that's, uh, I believe, still legal, and you get truncation. And so some of these things are so deeply embedded in code bases, in billion lines of code, that you can't get rid of them. And so to compensate, we start saying, OK, let's keep the compatible stuff. You can make your bugs if you really insist, but we'll provide alternatives. So linkage was made consistent, um, and uh, initialization was improved. And some of the incompatibilities that um, I've had a lot of trouble with over the years actually didn't come from C++. Uh, I used to say that the only thing C adopted from C++ without introducing an incompatibility was the slash slash comments, which, of course, I stole from uh, BCPL. Um, anyway, so this is difficult. And so the key idea of writing good code in C++ is represent concepts in code, usually as a um, class. And um, again, you have to think back about the world was very different in those days, so that, that was considered fairly radical because people wanted to write low-level code and low-level techniques. But that make, we may have to make code more declarative to, to make it more reliable, and we have to make more information available to compilers so that they can generate better code and catch more errors. The compiler is your friend, I was telling people. Uh, that's the one that finds all the little stupid things that you would otherwise have to start debugging to find. And I, I never like debugging. So early examples of the kind of uh, ideas you should represent in code are on that list there. And unfortunately, they are not all um, in the standard yet. Uh, so we are not perfect. I'm going to go further and further into what we have today, but I'm not going to pre pretend that we, we are there yet. So one of the things that came very, very early, I think in the first or second week, uh, was what later was known as uh, RAII. Apologies for the name, but I was very busy at the time and uh, didn't think about uh, uh, marketing and that kind of stuff. So basically in my lab book uh, from 79, it says that a new function creates a runtime environment for member functions and the delete functions reverse that. Because we know to build a runtime environment, you have to acquire resources and they have to be cleaned up. Um, then later, um, I, I realized calling them new function, delete functions confused everybody because they thought they had something to do with free store allocation with new and delete. So I renamed them constructor and destructor. Destructor is a bad pun again, but I never could re uh, resist a bad pun. And later, um, in the 80s, I started talking about it in terms of establishing class invariants uh, and things like that. Um, okay, so this was an example I used for uh, a lot of years back in the um, 80s and 90s. Basically, here is a naive, unsafe piece of code. I open a file, I use it, and I close the file. Except that in the real world, um, in, um, that use f may not fit on a slide, may not fit on a, on, a, on a screen, and so somebody might write a return statement or throw an exception or something, or something really bad happens. And if you look at this piece of code, the idea of a file handle is missing. There's just to a compiler, to a user that hasn't read the manual, it's just some pointers coming in and going out. 
and uh, with, with no information uh, unless you read the manual. And well, compilers don't read manuals and a lot of users don't either. So uh, we had to do something about it. And so in comes the idea of a, a resource handle. Here's a file handle. It manages the connection to the rest of the system, to the operating system. And importantly, the code that comes out of that is not just safer, it's also shorter and sometimes faster. Uh, that, that's the ideals. And so that's where we started and we got better support along the lines. I very soon realized that we had to be able to control copying. Uh, so this is one of the re uh, reasons we got operator overloading starting with, uh, with the assignment operator and then also constructors, of course. And so there's a recurring problem, avoiding expensive copying. I found somewhere in, I think, 83, that there was a systematic overhead in returning values from C++ compared to C. Um, and that had to be fixed. It took me a week. Uh, that led to some optimizations there. And there was always optimizations that allowed you to uh, return uh, resource handles and such, but they were not very well known and they were tricky. So eventually in C++11, we got uh, the, the move semantics, the move operators that allows us to control movement between scopes. And, and in, in C++20, we got more guaranteed copulation. So basically this thread of control of copying uh, carries on throughout the history of C++, getting better and better. Uh, that's uh, the idea. So we started, I needed uh, operator overloading. I needed operators because I wanted to mimic the, the way that we used our building types with user-defined types. Uh, square uh, complex numbers was an example. Uh, mathematical vectors were examples and such. So it started with, uh, with equality, and then it was actually square brackets and parentheses, and then um, and and or. And having gotten that far, driven by users from uh, Bell Labs, uh, we got the and and or from the hardware guys that needed to write simulators of hardware, and how can you make hardware without having and and or? And they certainly didn't want to write a and D and uh, OR, they wanted the, their uh, notation. And so having gotten that, we got the, the, the operators that people usually think about, plus and minus and such. And we got uh, smart pointers, needed arrow, and we still don't have operator dots, so we don't have smart references. This is a proposal that has come every year since the opening session of the C++ ANSI committee, and people still can't agree on it. So uh, a thing that came in very early also uh, was generic programming. Um, I needed it to parameterize containers, especially vectors, with um, arguments. Uh, this is worth mentioning because it was not featured very widely in the way people talked about uh, C++. But it was there. There was macros to, the, uh, to um, uh, declare parameterized things and define parameterized things, use them. And um, I was going around saying that we absolutely need to have parameterized types and macros is the way to do it. Well, I was half right. We needed the generic programming and macros are awful. They don't uh, scale. They work very well when it's uh, two people sharing an office writing code, but doesn't scale beyond that. So we have to get back, learn from experience, uh, know what we want, and then uh, carry on. Object-oriented programming was a really big deal in the 80s and 90s. Um, it was invented in 66 by Chris Nugor, who actually taught me about object-oriented programming. Uh, really great guy. And um, there was a lot of hype in the 70s, got no real traction. I mean, real programmers, TM, never heard of it. And the, the few that did uh, knew that it was uh, too specialized, uh, too slow, and uh, could only be done by uh, ge geniuses. Um, Christen said that uh, if we design a language for which you need 
PhDs from MIT to write the code, we have failed. Um, that's a thing worth remembering. And so C++ supported object-oriented programming from 84 when I put in virtual functions and things like that. And it's, it's not bad at it, but it was never C++ is an object-oriented programming language. Never. C++ was a language that, among other things, supported object-oriented programming. And if you define object-oriented programming as class hierarchies, as were popular, you'll see why. A lot of my favorite types, a lot of the types you saw in the beginning slide there, doesn't fit into hierarchies. Okay, now, um, C++ started to get popular. And that meant that a lot of people was explaining to a lot of other people what it was and what it wasn't, and they were getting it wrong quite uh, consistently. Um, and uh, so, prompted by some rumors of a history paper I was writing, um, I uh, was asked to write a book, and I wrote The Design and Evolution of C++, the purpose being to explain what C++ is, why, and what the ideals are. And basically, I realized that articulation of uh, ideals about ideas is absolutely essential. I've been so busy that I was saying to people, this is what you can do, this is what you can do, this is how you do it. I didn't say, why does it make sense to do it that way very much? And so the DNA uh, became that. And um, one of the observations by a few people is that C20 looks remarkably like um, the, the stuff that's in DNA, because DNA also did a thing that I'd never done before, which was to look ahead and says, where will this lead us? What can we get out of this? And so uh, that's what it is. If you want to, to look at the details more, look at my paper for the History of Programming Languages conference, uh, the one last year. Uh, you can also look at the one in, in 94, uh, because there's several, but the, the, the Hubble 4 paper is a good explanation of these ideas. And so uh, there was a set of general rules articulated in, um, in uh, DNA, uh, like evolution must be driven by real problems. I mean, I, I had a dread of uh, listening to uh, the theoreticians we had who told me exactly what was necessary, uh, as opposed to listening to my users uh, who had different ideas of what was important. And so I was wanting to listen to the users. I knew I couldn't do perfection. I knew I uh, couldn't have a research project going for five or 10 years before delivering anything, had to deliver something now. And now really meant, uh, well, this week usually. And always get a transition path from the past to the future. Uh, make the features affordable. I was writing code for people who didn't have the latest supercomputer available. Not, not for the people in the academic uh, departments where they had uh, hardware uh, for, for millions of dollars given to them. Um, it was more the little computers that the, the, the more or less average programmer uh, could use. Um, the, the, the research computer that I showed you the picture of that I started out on uh, had uh, not just 256K of memory for everybody, it, so, it served 40 researchers. And uh, we never saw an echo delay. I can't do that on the supercomputers we're using today. Echo delays? It should have gone out with the previous millennium or before. Okay. Okay, so articulating all of these things <coughs> and then explanations of what, what they meant. Um, I, I'm sure you have seen a lot of these principles. And also there, there was language technical rules where um, the first one actually was no implicit violations of the static type system. Anybody who has written C and C++ know that that is really hard to provide. Uh, but we're getting there. Uh, provide as good support for user-defined types as for built-in types, uh, very key early thing. And make things explicit, say what you mean, make things declarative. And I soon learned that syntax matters, often in perverse ways, people really love the strangest notations and you can't guess what they are. 
Sometimes they love things because it's complicated, so they can show how smart they are. But there's no, um, no, no, no guessing what what will be appro- would be approved of. And um, there was a few things that was missing in the uh, articulation. You you find discussions about simplifying things. They're all over the place. You find uh, discussions about error handling, but it was not articulated well, and we still suffer from that. Uh, also, uh, DNA gave a direction of evolution. It did not give a detailed prescription. Um, this allowed a lot of people to contribute. You'll see some pictures later, and uh, you, you you should know some of the names anyway. Uh, but uh, it, it was not an organization. It, it didn't channel effort, and quite often the problem with C++ is not that it doesn't have a facility, but that it has 20 varieties of the facility because a lot of people could and did contribute. Um, so C++ evolved and it grew over the years. Uh, it grew as a language and it grew as a uh, user community from, well, uh, zero and to uh, well over uh, five million these days. Um, so the, the DNA kind of uh, period, the early period, is, is that down the bottom there. Uh, you can see we got the, the classes and function declarations, coroutines, uh, const, operator, overloading, things like that. And so this is uh, where the standardization starts. And the problem of keeping things going, being level, stable, uh, uh, comes into the place. And it grew uh, rather nicely for uh, quite a few years, uh, despite lack of resources, lack of organization, um, lack of marketing, things like that. Okay, so why did it work? I mean, there was no doubt. That in, in a lot of people's mind, that C++ shouldn't have worked. It shouldn't have survived. Um, I have heard C++ declared dead uh, every year, well, since uh, 79. Um, so I'm, I'm a bit um, partly surprised that it didn't, because lots of people who proclaimed it dead, like the U.S. Uh, government, uh, has a lot of power, and uh, I don't have it. So why did it succeed? And I think one of the reasons, there's some reasons there why it got the lift off from older languages, why it survived, is that it enabled new programming styles, uh, significant improvements in scales of projects that was manageable, the management of complexity. It increased productivity. It lowered error rates that was measured. Uh, and it allowed us to build uh, better libraries without sacrificing performance. At the time, most people that worked on creating languages to handle complexity said, okay, machines are getting really fast. We don't need efficiency anymore. And then they come up with something that are 10 or 100 times slower than C. And then people try and write it. They love those languages. And then they say, well, wait a minute. I can't afford to deploy my stuff. So at the time, uh, essentially all of AI was done in Lisp. And whenever they wanted to actually sell a product based with, with artificial intelligence in it, they translated it into C or C++. Uh, so there was no decrease in performance that was important. And there was generality. Again, it did not narrow into a language for, say, um, GUI-based programming or, or something like that. that uh, what was a popular idea of narrowing of narrowing it into uh, numeric computation or something like that. And I did not insist on purity of the current fashionable style. And I got so much, many complaints from that. I was supposed to go around saying that we need a pure language. And uh, at the time, I was rather annoyed. I was saying purity is for Nazis. Um, I, it's, uh, I mean, I don't claim to know how everybody wants to write their code, and I get rather annoyed when somebody comes in and think they know, and I know they don't. I, uh, okay, so there was no insistence of purity. Uh, stability was good, not perfect, but good, and getting better. 
and it was culturally compatible with C and other things, and it was tool compatible. Those, are, I think, are the summary of why uh, C++ uh, didn't die early as it was predicted. And so the key foundations, the static type system were equal support for building types and user-defined types, both value and reference semantics, um, systematic and general resource management, the scope-based uh, stuff from constructors, destructors, efficient object-oriented programming, flexible and efficient generic programming, uh, compile time programming, that has increased in importance over the years, and direct use of machine and operating system resources that was always important. Uh, and there's always a problem because, you know, the hardware and the uh, operating systems can be rather weird, and they are also uh, incompatible across the user base. If you want to deliver a product over the major popular platforms and computers, the access to the hardware and to the operating system is a really hard thing to do uh, portably. And so the Hubble papers describe this. And so here's that slide again. And we are now up in the um, top, uh, top right corner. And we have lots of good stuff. We have C++ 20, C++ 14 and 17 are still being uh, rolled in in places. People are still trying to catch up with what we've got. And so the question is, can that uh, blob uh, deliver an improvement to the community comparable to what it was in the early days? Uh, by the way, that dip um, around 2000 came with the most massive hype for, for Java, C Sharp, um, and for uh, managed environments, big systems, and then we ran out of, of compute power. The single thread, um, think single thread performance stopped because we were starting to fry eggs on the chips if we went any further, and we went into more clever architectures, more um, different uses of, of, of the transistors, and so suddenly again, good programming, good programmers could outperform um, a, a system that couldn't quite use the hardware. Similarly, a lot of people realized that every platform owner had their own private language that they wanted you to use, and if you wanted to deliver across platforms, you better do something else. And C and C++ tended to be the answer to that. So will C++ enable the liftoff from the world of C++ 11 that we are currently living in, most of us? And yes, I think so. I consider it possible, even likely, but not without significant effort. Um, we, we need to t teach ourselves and the community how to use the facilities well, and we need to develop further support for facilities in the uh, directions that we're working for. And we have to see C++ as an ecosystem. I can't spill. Okay. Um, and uh, not just as a set of individual features. There's so many papers and, pres uh, and uh, presentations that says, look at this little corner and, and, and look at all these clever things I can do here. That's quite distracting and it turns off a lot of people that are not in the community already. And um, if there's anything I dislike for a talk, it's the one that says, look at this code. It's really complicated. You don't understand it. I understand it, so I'm smarter than you. Any talk that has that format, I, I, I don't like. Okay, so we have to focus on uh, the whole community, the whole um, uh, tool chains um, and design techniques, etc. And we have to focus on use, what, what should be done, what, not just what can be done. So uh, I'm going to talk about that for, for the rest of the talk here. Um, and I'm talking uh, with the idea that we, we need to have a direction. We can't just pick anything that, that looks fashionable at the time, if nothing else, because fashions change. Uh, but also because the language would become incoherent. 
the aim is a dense web of interrelated, mutually supportive features. That's a big sentence, but it is the opposite of just adding features so that you get the Swiss Army uh, knife model of language. Uh, most of the code we write doesn't use one feature at a time. Uh, I don't want to do object-oriented programming or generic programming or uh, functional programming. I want to take the bits as they fit my problem area and use a combination of them, and I want the language features to support such use of a combination. And uh, feature interaction is a very hard problem. Combination of features is a, a very hard design problem and a usage problem. So when you should focus on use, I'm thinking mostly about management of complexity. And, and one of the, the slogans I have is to make a simple task simple. Uh, and, and of course, not to make it uh, impossible or unnecessarily hard to do really uh, complicated things. And that leads us to some notion of layers of abstraction. It leads us to clean interfaces. And it leads us again back to the static type safety so that I can trust my interfaces. It leads to resource management in many, many areas. Um, and it leads us to looking at error handling. And so the idea is you can tune a program. Ideally, you start with a really clean, safe interface. And if you need something that is more specialized and takes advantage of, of uh, special things, you can do that. You peel a layer off the onion. And if that's not good enough, you peel off another layer. In the end, you get down to the hardware and you use specialized hardware all the way down. And the reason I call it the onion principle is that each time you peel a layer off, you cry more. Uh, it's, uh, you, you, when you take away from the clean, safe interface, uh, you, you pay for it in, uh, in, in work. Okay, uh, so... <sighs> There's been a lot of contribu contributors to this. Uh, the standards committees are the obvious, that's where you get a name, but also a lot of tool builders, a lot of application developers. Uh, I'll show a couple of pictures, but if, if I should mention even a lot, I would use the whole uh, talk. So thanks to everybody, but uh, I can't mention everybody just now. And then I'm going to pick some topics from the, uh, the index, or from DNE, and see how it reflects in, in modern C++. Uh, so the zero overhead rule comes in again and again. It was for a long time the sharpest uh, knife in our, vocab in, in our tool set. What you don't use, you don't pay for. Um, that's what keeps C++ distinct from some of the managed languages. And what you do use, you couldn't hand code any better. That is, we don't want people to drop levels of abstraction too soon uh, without need for it. And this is a constant and pervasive uh, effort. And it, it, it comes to this idea that you, 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 it's not enough to be able to do something. You have to be able to afford to do it. Uh, you have to be able to afford to do it in the environment you're in on the kind of computers you can afford to buy and run. Um, I took a little example there, matrix sum equals M2 plus M3. Um, that should generate code that's at least as good as if you are fiddling directly with arrays. And for many decades, uh, at least three decades, we've been able to do things like that so that it actually runs faster than most handwritten loops. Um, that's the kind of idea that dealing with. Uh, no implicit violations of the static type system. Um, that's hard to do and we have to increase it. Um, Dennis said that uh, C was a strongly typed language that was weakly checked. Um, I would like it to be strongly typed and strongly checked. And so one idea that I discussed with Dennis, and Dennis wanted something called fat pointers. A fat pointer is simply a pointer with an associated uh, size so that you could uh, loop over the, um, the array without uh, getting an uh, a, a, a overrun. 
And actually, so we have now span uh, in C++ uh, 20. And so a span knows its size. And uh, you can go for all elements in that. And since uh, the size is known, you don't actually have to check, check the range there. So it'll run faster than a, a lot of uh, users. And uh, so the language requires static type system to be obeyed. That is the rules. It's just been too hard to do. And uh, we're, we're not completely there. Uh, providers good support for user-defined types as built-in types. Uh, we're getting there. One of the last things is uh, user-defined literals so that we can have uh, constants that, um, th that has proper types. So that said there, um, 2i plus 3 is uh, obviously a complex number. And uh, there's a date there from the C++ 20 standard library. October the 25th, uh, 2021, it compiles, actually at compile time, into a um, time point, which is just one value. Uh, so it's not just clean and readable, it's also about as deadly efficient as you can get it. Um, preprocessor usage should be eliminated. I, I really, really dislike the preprocessor. And I would like to write code like you see there. There's no sharps in that piece of code. Uh, import the standard library, use the namespace chrono, and do some manipulations with dates. And over breakfast, I ran it, and it says that we are in Denver on the 25th of uh, this year, uh, this month. Okay, and again, this is not a single facility that says, okay, here is the alternative to the preprocessor, it, it picks off things that the preprocessor does and are worth doing, and then provides better alternatives, more strongly typed, more easily checked, more easily generating code for, less error prone, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, so basically, um, we, 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 read, we, we can overcome compile time overheads, we can get rid of uh, bugs, and one thing that people tend to underestimate when they look at the uh, one little macro isn't too bad, is that it cripples uh, C++ tool building. Uh, what the compiler looks at is different from what you look at because the preprocessor did strange things to your code, and that has bothered uh, the C++ tool uh, community for ages. And so, um, I actually said so in, in design and evolution of, of C++, that was the main reason given why uh, the preprocessor was bad. And we need an elegant, efficient, common, non-textual representation of C++. We, we don't have something that, um, that does all of those things, but uh, I think Gabby Dos Reyes will give a talk about something that is along the lines that, that I'm thinking about uh, at this conference. Um, modules was one of the major things that uh, was coming in to, to help uh, make the preprocessor redundant. It was always the ideal. I discussed this uh, with uh, Dennis. Um, the, uh, the one definition rule, ODR, um, is there to pretend that there's only one, exactly one definition of every entity in the program. Uh, Dennis and I agreed that was it, and um, yeah, the, all the rules, the pages of rules, are there um, to, to fudge it in a, in a world uh, littered with uh, preprocessor includes and defines. And uh, we now have module definitions and imports that can realize uh, true ODR uh, as we want to. It's going to be very hard to deploy at scale. There's, uh, 20, there's 50 years of practice with the preprocessor. Lots of tools are optimized for the preprocessor. Lots of people have um, uh, macros and uh, includes uh, hardwired into their brains. So, but we're going to get there because there's major advantages. The major advantage of modu modules are simply modularity. If I include two files, uh, then if I do it in the opposite order, I might get a different answer. 
that can give surprises and it gives overheads in the uh, compilers. Furthermore, includes are transitive, so if I'm using one of your um, header files, I get everything that you include to build your header files. Modules are si simple, they, they are, if you import two, doesn't matter which order you Im import them in, and imports are not transitive, so there's far less information to deal with. Uh, this is really hard, but uh, we can do it. And there's an example of a module. I want to export a sequence printer. It's the smallest module I could fit on a slide. Uh, and to build my um, sequence printer, I import IO streams. I, import, I use the namespace STD, which you know you shouldn't do in, in include files because that would be, um, be exported, but it's not exported here. It's just an implementation detail. So is my uh, utility library that I built myself, had nothing to do with it. And then I can write the one function that I export that, that simply prints something that is uh, printable. Um, I've defined myself a concept, a printable input range, so that I could specify that. Um, again, notice the feature combination there. There's a range for, there's a concept for, for, for um, generic programming, and there's the uh, module facility here. Um, I borrowed an example for a library for, uh, from um, somebody in Germany um, that had a library that comes in two versions. Um, you have to have two versions because you have to have your old users and your new users. And uh, basically the one includes the library and it takes a second and a half to compile. The other one import the library and it takes 64 milliseconds to compile. Um, we can't promise you 25 times improvements every time you turn something into a module, but sometimes, and you should think about factors, not a few percent. Um, I did a little um, experiment um, because I made a proposal to the standards committee that we had a module STD that gives you everything in the standard library. So that uh, once you start writing code, you don't have to think about where you get it from in the standard library. Just give me the whole thing. It's good for teaching. It's good for small experiments. It's good for getting started. You can do more fine grain later if that's what you want and you can you know, use your own uh, modules and such. So this is the way I would like Hello World to look like. Import STD, uh, see out Hello Modern World. And um, the arguments for including everything in the standard library for large modules is that you can't afford it. That happens to be wrong. Um, as you can see there, the Hello World compared to, um, with, with import STD compared to include uh, IO stream is a factor of 10 faster to compile. I did a uh, um, a, a little example where I, I took uh, nine popular headers and used facilities from them. There, I only got a factor of five. Um, I will say that from, from my experience, it's not unreasonable to think of a compile time speed off of about a factor of, uh, of, of seven. Uh, I have seen zero and I have seen uh, 80. Uh, so it's, it's somewhere in that part. But there's a lot of to be done in simplifying the code and getting it to compile faster. You will not be drinking as much coffee as you used to. Um, okay, so the modules were done in the standards committee. Um, there's uh, the three key uh, people for the three um, major compilers who, who did that work. And we have to work on now how we use the modules well. I mean, this example is to say, let's use modules in this particular way, which is rather different from the way we used include files. We should not do like they did when they invented cars. They, they, they looked very much like a horse-drawn carriage without the horse. And we are prone to do that when we get a new feature. And so uh, having a granularity of the standard library reflects the 50 years of standard library uh, headers is just not right. We can do better than that. And um, how do we distribute sets of modules? Um, how do you make uh, modules available for static analysis? 
I'm very keen on static analysis, you will find out. And um, so these are the kind of, of things that has to be done. We don't just have a feature, we have to figure out how to use the feature. Uh, generic programming has been something we've been working on for years. My ideal is very simple. Generic programming is just programming. And so when it's, there's not any big problem to explain that, uh, oh, again, I can't spell. So this, the first one should, of course, be square root. Uh, double square root of double, we know that. We learned that from the beginning. And I want sort to be something that you do a sort of a range for. And um, the design evolution of uh, C++ uh, section on templates starts with three pages of apologies not to be able to do that. I didn't know how to do it. Basically, we started out with macros um, and I looked for templates, tried to figure out what templates should be, general, flexible, zero, overhead, well-specified interfaces, and realized that I couldn't do all three and I asked around and nobody else seemed to be able to do all three either. You can pick two. And so I picked the first two. And then we tried in the standards committee to get concepts into um, in, into C++ uh, OX, uh, modeled on classes that failed, uh, complexity uh, grew uh, too high, uh, cost was uh, high, and we now have them um, in, uh, in 20, uh, roughly the way they are supposed to be. Um, we can constrain the template arguments. Um, now we couldn't uh, until um, C++ 17, and basically we can say sortable um, iterators and then sort, and then it comes to the question, how do we define sortable so that you can afford to do it? Uh, we don't want to do it at runtime because then we would get a massive overhead compared to uh, people that didn't check their arguments, and that is against the uh, zero overhead principle. It would lead to disuse. So here's the um, concepts, they're based on use patterns. You can define a concept uh, by specifying how it can be used. There's equality comparable uh, of two types and it requires you to, um, to, to be able to do equals and not equals and generate uh, booleans. And uh, that works for both different types, T and U, and you can default to uh, T equals uh, U, so it'll work. And you don't have to write this because you can find it in the standard library now, but that's the way it used. This goes back to work that was actually back in the uh, in, in 06 and a bit before that by, by Gabby and me. Um, and uh, you can compose uh, concepts out of other concepts, which is the way we use it, just like we don't usually write all of our code in the language itself. We build libraries and then use those libraries. Uh, similarly, we do with, with concepts. Concepts are uh, what specifies what uh, types are required by a template or something like that. And so I can say that a sortable range is a random access range. You find that in standard library. And it has uh, sortable iterators, again, uh, standard stuff. And if I want my own forward sortable range, that is something that I can sort, even though I cannot get random access, uh, I can define it uh, myself like that. And then we can now have both um, sort functions uh, co cooperating. That is, if you have something with random access, you get the, the standard version. If you have one that doesn't, um, doesn't have random access, you can uh, do without it. Uh, the simplest way is to copy into a, um, in, into a vector, sort it, and copy the elements back again. Uh, there's also clever algorithms for uh, sorting things without doing that for a forward range. Notice that we don't have to build up hierarchies or explicitly defined relationship between concepts. Uh, the compiler is quite capable of figuring out whether two sets of predicates are subsets of each other or uh, disjoint or such. So we don't have to say it. So you retain the flexibility of generic programming 
in, uh, rather than getting the, the, the more constrained uh, world of the object-oriented programming with hierarchies. And so we have to represent relationships. It is not just types of types because most algorithms take more than one argument. And if there's two argument types, there's a relationship between those two types. Otherwise, why is it one function if there's no relationship between the types of the arguments? And so I find that most um, templates require multiple typed concepts. So concepts is uh, a predicate. It's a predicate over types and values of one or more uh, types and values. And uh, so there's a relation between uh, types and single argument concepts. Basically, a type specifies what you can do to an object and how that object is laid down in memory. A single argument concept specifies what you can do to the object, but it doesn't say anything about how it is laid down in memory. And so my idea is actually is to use concept where we now use types, uh, except for uh, defining layout. That will lead to much more flexible code and I think without loss of performance. Um, and so we can do better than we are now. We're not at the end of the thing. We have to explore design and implementation techniques. We have to improve uh, type deduction. Um, we have to get better support in the standard library. And I still miss axioms to uh, say something about the semantics of a concept. If you go back to the C++ OX design, it had, had axioms in it. They got lost on the, on the way further. Um, I didn't mention uh, key support for, for, for templates and generic programming. In, in DNE, I did not mention lambdas and variabic templates. Uh, lambda is because I didn't think about it, variadic templates because I didn't know them yet. Um, there's an example of a piece of code there I would like to write, and uh, I can't because we are not quite there yet. I get this forward, forward sortable sequence, and so I would like to copy it into a vector, sort the vector, and then copy the, um, the, the buffer back again into my sequence, and I would like to do it without dropping to the level of iterators when I don't have to. Uh, we can't do that yet. It's just an example of uh, what we might be able to do in the future. In object-oriented programming, um, I, it's, it's pretty good, and I'm not um, having an emphasis on that, but uh, it's, uh, it's used far more than it's discussed these days, so uh, don't forget it. Uh, there's two things in DNE that, that would improve um, object-oriented programming and its interaction with generic programming, which is uh, multi-methods, so that you can have a, um, a, a thing that has a dynamic lookup on two arguments instead of just one, and also uniform function calls so that we don't have to decide on our syntax based on what the library provider uh, decided for us and so that I can write my concepts simply saying I'm using this and I don't have to know whether it's implemented in a functional style or in an object-oriented style. Um, error handling is a, um, is, is a, is a big deal. Um, it was not specifically listed in uh, the rules of Tom and DNE, and that was a bad mistake because that led me to discuss the issue on the label of exceptions, which is not the right label. It's not that you program exceptions, you program error handling, sometimes using exceptions. And so exceptions were used for separating uh, error handling code from mainline code so that you didn't have to be aware of it all the time. And uh, it was never meant for localized uh, error checks. And it was meant to be used in combination with RAII so that you don't have all of these stray pointers floating around creating leaks when you have exceptions passed by. Um, it, it, it was uh, very much a combination with the thoughts about resource management, not just a standalone feature. And it's a very inflamed topic. It's really hard to discuss error handling because everybody has ideas and everybody has ideas about what other people's ideas are 
and that makes it quite hard to discuss without emotion. Uh, also, there are too many alternatives. Um, one of the reasons I did exceptions was to simplify code where there usually was about four different ways of reporting an error. And when I had to write in a library, I had to take care of these four uh, ways of doing errors, uh, non-local errors. And then I say, well, we can do exceptions and we will just have one. And I ran into the n plus one problem. You have four ways of doing things. You um, are going to unify it so that it gets simpler and now you have five. And because the old ones don't go away. And it really is more like an N plus M problem because there are many people who think they have a solution to this problem. And so it gets worse and worse. If I have to write a piece of code, I have to know which of the about 10 ways people write their error handlers today um, to, to be able to write really uh, reliable code. And also, um, error handling is not localized to a single domain. And how you handle error as well is not an absolute. It's something that depends on the degree of reliability you need, the, the degree of uh, the complexity of your code and the amount of uh, hardware support, uh, alternatives you have available. But it's critically um, important. Reliability is a systems issue, it's not just a theory issue. So um, there's many uh, alternatives error states, error codes, exceptions, and contracts. And we, we need to make progress here. And hopefully that progress is not to get three versions of each of what uh, is on that slide, which unfortunately is a fairly likely uh, outcome of, of these discussions. So two things we should remember is that exceptions have served many very well. And exceptions have been unacceptable to many. And there's reasons for that. Uh, the reason uh, exceptions came in was it handles, care, uh, handles cases where there's no return value to test. That's operators and constructors, for instance. And uh, it was integrated with resource management. And it saved us from pervasive forwarding on, of unknown errors. Um, you will have seen code w where uh, the function is mainly a nest of tests of uh, error codes that comes from lower levels of uh, code. And when a new error comes in at a lower level, you have to add another uh, error code and such. So that's hard. On the other hand, there's no doubt that we have systems where uh, the exception handling mechanism itself will press out functionality. You can have the functionality, you can have the exceptions. On the other hand, if people write code where they want exceptions to be fast, I don't think that's what exceptions were designed for. And um, we can improve the implementations of exceptions today. We can improve them quite dra drastically. But you are never going to get exception handling in the C++ style to be as fast as a simple function call. Uh, that's not what they're for. They are to separate the uh, concerns about error handling and the mainline code. And so I think we'll always have both exceptions and error codes, whether people like it or not, and we can do better things. And one thing that I look at in every discussion is RAII. Do we lo lose the connection to, um, to, to resource management? If we do, I, I don't like it. And uh, do not think that everybody has the same needs as you or think in the same way as you do. Concurrency and parallelism is a major, major issue. It has been around since the very first days. Um, there was cold chains in um, the early C with classes, C++ uh, libraries. It was the first C with classes library. We would not be here if it wasn't for cold chains. Um, this was my bread and butter through the 80s. That was what kept C++ alive. Um, unfortunately, the trickery I did with registers to implement it couldn't be done on a Spark without collaboration from Sun. 
and they weren't they were not convinced that coal change was a good thing and worth spending time on so we lost them but anyway c++ 11 gave us a major boost by getting a memory model that could handle uh, what kind of work that was done with c and c++ as opposed to higher level models that uh, needed the lower level model to to be implemented and we have made steady improvements of that and coroutines are back. I'm really happy about that. I've uh, missed them for uh, about 30 years. That's bad. So coroutines, my key use ca cases were sequences, the sequences and generators, pipelines and networks of pipes. Uh, building a application as a network of coroutines is, is a way of, of doing of managing very serious complexity, including asynchrony uh, sometimes. Um, and that's, we've got it now, but we don't have standard support in the standard library for the simpler uses of coroutines. And that's one of the things I hope we get for C23. Uh, there's a very simple example. Uh, Gorn Isherov uh, was the main. Um, uh, supplier of the ideas and implementation that got into C20. So basically what you're doing is you are saving the state in between calls of a function. You're saving it in a return value so that you can have uh, different ways of saving things, different constraints, synchronous, asynchronous. And you can write little code like um, auto for, for all V in Fibonacci, uh, write them out. Uh, that's an infinite loop, uh, unfortunately, but uh, it fits on a slide. Uh, and parallel algorithms is where I really would like to go. Um, if I can get somebody else to deal with the concurrency and the uh, logging or whatever is needed to, to write the code and simply, I can say, simply sort uh, that, uh, that, that uh, container, then, then I'm happier and we are moving in that direction. That has a lot of promise. Uh, if we can get concurrency uh, to disappear into parallel algorithms, it becomes simpler and easier to optimize. And uh, so I want standard library support for coroutines, more algorithms. I really find that th there's not a find or in the uh, standard library. There was a find or in the task library in 1980. Um, it was one of the first things I needed. And the point is that you have to return a container of stuff. Well, we know how to return containers now. It's, a, it's the move semantics, right? We just built the vector and return it. Couldn't do that well in the late 80s when the STL came around, but we can do better now. Also, I really miss a message queue. Again, this is one of the things that was in the very first uh, coroutine library. Uh, it's just a message queue. Why don't we have one? Uh, yes, that would have been nice. Uh, there's other things. So now back to the issue of we need stability because we have billions of lines of code, millions of programmers. We can't just break all of that. On the other hand, we have to make progress. And... Um, I, I realized that fairly early on, and we've been trying to, to find a way of balancing these two uh, constraints. And my current estimate these days of how to do this best is the C++ core guidelines, uh, which is basically a group of people's idea of what modern C++ should be, and that it's evolving, it'll be changed. We have to distinguish between what's legal, the standard has to maintain things to be um, stable, but we also have to move the community ahead. We have to see what the ideals are, how we can better reflect the ideals. Uh, the core guidelines goes in that direction and you can find them on the web and you can contribute uh, if you want to. And so, yeah, we distinguish between what, what's legal and what's uh, good. Uh, even C did that. Those of you who were around can remember that there was C code and then there was lint uh, to, to, uh, to catch things that the compiler couldn't handle. 
we, we need something similar today, and the core guidelines are built so that you can write code checkers, um, static checkers that does that. And so we can write code that's type safe, efficient, and maintainable. And um, that's uh, what we can do. And so it's essential to enforce the type rules, no type violations, no memory corruption, no resource leaks, and no garbage collector. The general strategy is not to generate garbage. And uh, no undefined behavior. We can do that today, but we can't do it without help. We need static analysis to verify it. You cannot get the guarantees for what I say is essential there in a realistically sized program without, without help. So um, selective, uh, also you need to bring it in selectively. You can't just get from uh, old code with all the messy stuff in to, to, to modern code that, that's, that's correct. You have to grow gradually. It uses the strategy of a, a subset of a superset. That is, first you extend the language with the, with the libraries that you need to do your work well, and then you stop um, use of the uh, low level, the dangerous features outside the implementation of those libraries. Because some of the most dangerous features, some of the most uh, tricky features at scale I said it's exactly the ones you need to implement things like a vector or a um, process scheduler. Uh, so you can't just take them away. And so the, the strategy is to increase the libraries and then uh, subset. And uh, so what? I mean, did I anticipate all of uh, C++20's facilities in the 80s? Of course not. I mean, there's no way. Uh, I mean, we have to engineer the language. We have to learn from experience. We have to rely on feedback. Uh, that is essential as it was. And is C++ perfect? No, of course it isn't perfect. Uh, how would you define perfection? Um, I mean, if, if somebody comes and tells you they have a perfect language, it's, well, it's either a fool or a salesman or both. It's, uh, it, it, it's, you can't even define perfect. And so we, ha we, we are not at the end yet. We probably never will be. We have to uh, learn from experience and improve things. And so um, this is a talk about um, how we got here uh, and uh, not, not so much about future. I have, of course, strong opinions about the future, the feature set, the technical details. So I'll just list it here. And once I'd made this list, I noticed that there's talks about just about everything at this conference. So you can go to your program and you can find talks about all of these things. Work is going on. Um, I don't think there's talk about static reflection. Uh, there should be. But, um, and, and if there is, I, I missed it. But all the other things you can go and look in depth at what I was talking about here. Okay, thank you. And I, I think we have time for a Q and A. I don't know how we all, oh, there's a microphone there and there's a microphone there. Is it up? Yeah. Uh, so two uh, random features and just your thoughts on where they could fit in C++ in the future. One is continuation passing style and the other is like true immutable values. Uh, true immutable values? Yeah. Uh, I don't have a detailed answer to those. Um, no. Uh, you, you can, of course, do it, but I have not looked into how it will fit with the rest. Uh, that's the, the issue.
We have a question from online. Oh. Uh, you talked about banning features you do not like. What are those? Um, I, I know I can't ban them, so I don't think all too hard about it. Um, basically, my feeling is that the major feature, the major feature set is, is about right, and that every detail of every major feature could be improved with 2020 hindsight. Um, if you go back, uh, you'll see things like the, um, the thing that had bothered me constantly for years is the fact that the fundamental types, the integers and the characters, can be converted both ways implicitly. I mean, that's just not a good idea. And it only came in because explicit type conversion was not invented till a couple of years later uh, in the C world. And so if, if I could ban it, um, don't uh, convert a floating point number to a character uh, implicitly. Fortunately, a lot of compilers agree with me these days, so you can probably, in many cases, you, you can't get away with that. But, but it is a fact that the early C++ compilers uh, gave you warnings that you couldn't suppress for that kind of errors. But when things scaled, other people were uh, a bit scared of uh, telling their users that their old code really was broken. And so they took away those uh, heavy duty uh, moralizing that it was. Also, a lot of the syntax could be much better um, I, I don't like the declarator syntax from C, and I think the um, C++ template syntax is, is far too heavyweight. Um, I like the functional notation for uh, templates also. Um, we, we're getting some of it, but, but not as much as I would like. Uh, that's, I, I could go on for a long time, probably should. So I'll stop now and take, take another question. So this is one of my favorite C++ books. Um, because it's brief, you can maybe get some of your coworkers to read it in its entirety. Um, you can read it in your entirety pretty quickly. Um, and it's, you know, I know it's going to be good. There's a lot of questions. To get. So um, I'm interested if there's a plan for a third edition, because the only issue with this right now is that it's a little dated. And then your more, your longer book, um, See the whole language that's made about you know printed about that thick uh, edition of that. Yeah, I, there there will be a third edition of that book. There will be a third edition of the uh, Swan book for novices. Basically, those two books are for for different um, domains. People who need to learn to program and people who need to get upgraded to, to modern C plus plus. The question is when. There's a big question. Uh, about that one, uh, should I do it now or should I do it when the outline of C++23 is uh, known? Because I would really like the opening example to be import STD. And I would really like to be able to describe cool chains at some depth. Um, getting to my favorite uh, networks of, uh, of, of pipes. And uh, can I do that now? I would have to uh, take a chance and saying, well, there's a proposal for import STD, and if the standard doesn't get it, you'll have to do it yourself. Uh, similarly, there are uh, libraries for coroutines that um, probably will come in, and uh, maybe I'll take a chance, I don't know. Uh, but those are the key issues. On the other hand, um, we need to think about how people learn to write C++ from scratch. Um, there's still a fair number of people doing that, and for that it's the uh, Swan book that is uh, still at C++ 14 level. Uh, okay, and the big, the big book, not any day soon, it takes something like two years full time to do. And I'm not sure anybody reads something that thick anymore. 
so the philosophy is if you can get people started and get people to use the online facilities and the um, more specialized books, that, that may be uh, a better use of my time. I guess I've learned the Swan book, but I meant the larger book. I meant like the C++ yeah, book. Yeah, I know. It's more not necessarily for novices. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, that's the one I doubt I'll do. Uh, because I think the problem is to get enough people up to speed so that they can listen to, say, the videos from this conference and other conferences so that they can uh, look into specialized topics. There are books for that. I, I'm not sure that there is a, that, that there's enough people who would benefit from a 2,000-page um, two-volume book uh, that would take me uh, two full years of my life to write. All right, thank you. We have another question from online. Can you talk about how optimizing code in the 80s was different from today? As examples, different caches, different tooling, register management, maybe something else? <sighs> I didn't hear that very well. It came across very soft. Could, could you try and repeat? Can you talk about how optimizing code in the 80s was different from today? As examples, different caches, different tooling, register management, maybe something else. Yeah. Um, basically, in the 80s, you could understand your hardware. And you could optimize based on your understanding of the hardware. These days, the hardware is just so complicated that you can't rely on that. And it is also changing quite often so that you would have to retune your code when you get, say, a different number of cores. So I would say that you could rely on your understanding in the 80s you could think about registers, you could think about how much, um, how, 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 how many instructions you uh, were executing, you could think about how much data those instructions got from memory. Try and do that today and you are fooling yourself. Um, there, there's so much dynamic going on that you don't understand and that you're probably going to pessimize your code by trying to optimize it. So you have to rely on the hardware doing dynamic optimization and static analysis and optimizers that can do uh, truly uh, miraculous things sometimes and uh, sometimes do a horrible job if there's a mismatch between uh, what you think you are doing and what you are doing. Uh, personally, I tend to look into a couple of things, very simple, Don't read too much memory, and when you read it, read it in a predictable way. And much things beyond that, um, I would rather leave to the optimizers uh, to do. And if I really, really have to tweak below that, I have to then start looking at the machine architecture on the particular processor I'm using. And I don't like to do that because in some sense it's a waste of time because if you want that degree of performance, next year's computer is going to be better at it and you will have to do it again. So, uh, it's a pretty old language um, and it's been around for a while and you talked about how you know, evolution is this process of feedback and so we, we, we develop new layers of the standard every three years um, and then it takes companies many, many years, you know, still, still many are like decades behind the standard. Um, and then you compare that to some modern languages like Rust, which are, you know, sort of uh, accelerating almost past C++ in, in terms of some of the features they're able to deliver. And yet, do you have any comments or ideas about how um, C++ can maintain these, um, you know, highly valuable properties of, of stability whilst uh, you know, uh, speeding up the pace of the evolution of the language? Sure. Um, I'm not sure I want to speed up the evolution of the language. Uh, I want to maintain the stability. I would like to be sure that I wasn't chasing fads. Uh, 
any language that is successful will get the problems of C++. Um, I, I know there's people who think that they can maintain a modern language that changes uh, rapidly um, forever, but that's, that's not really the case once you get to the hundreds of thousands uh, or millions of users and the billions of lines of code. And it, is not, uh, it is very hard to maintain if there's more than one implementation and if there's one, just one implementation, people will worry. So I, I, I'm not too worried. Um, we have to carefully improve C++, maintaining, um, maintaining compatibility maintaining stability, and if some things can't be improved, say a library that can't be improved, build another library and uh, let people use the, uh, the, the new library and uh, fade out the old one. And uh, yeah, people have been predicting C++'s death every year for the last 40. So I'm a little bit reluctant to believe uh, the, the, the current uh, things. New languages either cease to be new or they die. And uh, if they cease to be new, they have to face the problems of stability versus evolution and how to get novel features in and deployed and taught. Or if they're not successful, well, they don't have a problem. Uh, hi, uh, kind of similar question. It seems like C++ has been influenced by a lot of other languages and you, you have a lot of experience with other languages around design. And so I was curious uh, how you see C++ interacting with other languages, uh, languages like managed languages or, man or, or languages like Rust. Do you still pick up um, features or ideas, concepts from other languages or, yeah, uh, just how does that relationship yeah, this is, this is a kind of question I get a lot, and I think it's slightly misphrased. Um, it is extremely hard to adopt a feature straight from another language. What is really happening is that ideas are around in the community, in the academic world, uh, for, for many years before they get fashionable in any language. And you tend to be aware of new features long before they become fashionable. And so uh, there's a much longer gestation period for, for novel features than, than people are uh, thinking about. I mean, Auto, I designed and implemented in 82 or 83, and then it was kicked out. It was not something I got from languages using let. Um, similarly, Range 4 has been around since the uh, dawn of time, basically. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, invariance and such was pioneered in the 70s and such. So what you do is you try and see how ideas are presented in various languages and try and estimate to which extent they are successes, and in which sense they are successes for the feature set in another language, and whether they would be still be successes in the feature set of C++. Uh, usually, when a language feature is, is adopted, as I said, it comes from back in time, and probably inspired and uh, observed from other languages, but also with very careful notice about feature composition uh, in, in uh, both the language you're looking at and in, in C++. But uh, it's, it's something that I'm very aware of. Um, and I, I tend to look at the feature composition as the, the key issue. So in this talk and in your books, you're not shy about your dislike of the preprocessor. And we're gradually on our way to 
eliminating a lot of the need for it. But one of the things that it still does better than anything else is generate code. And um, I know there's the meta classes proposal, but I don't see this on the, the future. What is your opinion on code generation in the language? Um, the first line there is so static reflection. It is on there. And yes, that, that is there. And I know that in some cases you can be, build better code with um, the preprocessor. I also know that many claims are better pro code with the preprocessor or better code from template metaprogramming are simply not true. Uh, that is, it is really, really important to measure and especially in sort of published stuff, people tend to, to get overexcited with some technique or another and it will give a better result for a very narrow uh, domain. Um, so first, I'm going to be doubtful. And second, um, I'm going to point to, to templates as a, a way and, and constant, uh, constant evaluation for compile time uh, evaluation for uh, alternatives to, uh, to, to macros. And that was on the slide. And then finally, first line on the slide that happens to be there. Uh, I had hoped something would happen for 23, but I've given up that hope. It's not going to happen uh, till at least 26. Hi, Brianna. Hi. Uh, this is not so much a question. Um, uh, I really wanted to thank you uh, for a number of things. When the f first, you know, whenever I see you talk about the history of C++, I always feel this immense pride to have had some small part in participating in it. But also, you know, I hear when you talk about the, the basic values behind of, of language design that you have applied here, I hear my own values and I realize I learned those from you. I learned those from in your community and uh, my participation in the C++ community was probably the biggest learning experience and career changer in my entire life. So <laughs> I, I really want to thank you for, for opening that opportunity for me and opening the world up. Oh, um, th thank you very much. That's uh, very much. And uh, welcome back. Okay. Uh, just, I'm curious uh, about that. Uh, do you have any plan to extend uh, a standard algorithm to support some well-defined areas such as, you know, algorithm about the graph processing or machine learning. Or just I wanted to know, maybe it's, uh, it's better to use third-party library and there is no plan to standardize this type of algorithm. This is hard. It's one of the fastest moving fields there is. And C++ is deeply into AI, ML, and uh, with the TensorFlow and libraries like that. But also the hardware is changing very fast. I don't see the standards committee being able to do something in a couple of years. It, it'll take longer. So I think it will have to come from what you call third party. And um, there's a talk by Mike Wong and somebody else um, at this conference that, that might touch upon uh, those kinds of things. So I, I suggest uh, you go there. Uh, it's, it's not something I have plans uh, for. At most, I have some hopes. Acknowledging that there's many answers to what belongs in the standard library, um, what would you say are your criteria or philosophy around what you think does belong being standardized into the standard library? 
Um, I articulated an idea for the C++ 98 uh, library, which was basically uh, what it took to, uh, for what was needed for separately developed libraries to communicate and interoperate. And, and that's still sort of the rock bottom of, of the way I look at it. Uh, similarly, modeling the underlying hardware is, is part of that. And so the, the, the massive work that was done for C++11 for the memory model and for modeling the, the thread and uh, lock um, um, style of concurrency was absolutely essential. And, and currently there are work on uh, what's called executors um, for creating a more general model of concurrency, which again fits into this pattern. It says, how can my code communicate with your code, especially if there's this asynchronous uh, path in between? Uh, so that's, that, that's, that's my fundamental thinking. But then there's a completely different area where the C++ library has been not very well served compared to the massive commercial libraries that can throw money at it. We don't have any money. Um, and, and that is a particular area that is needed by a lot of programmers. Think about a, a JSON uh, library, a JSON parser, things like that. They exist and they're good and we have um, a dozen or two dozen of them and none of them are standard. And it would be nice if the library could get into that uh, to, to create a, a standard. But it's not easy. Uh, look at the um, look at the regex library um, that that sort of got complicated and seems to have become a bit old fashioned faster than it should. So <sighs> things that you need to communicate to collaborate and things that everybody needs. And we are, I think, reasonably good at the former and not all that good at the latter. Uh, look at the graphics uh, library and things like that, it's hard. Okay, I think we are timed out. Thank you very much. <laughs>